Hi there, my name's Dale from Bodycore, one of the PT mentors, and what we're going to look at today is the circulatory system. It's a webinar and it is for the level two gym instructing qualification. Session aims to gain a basic understanding to the circulatory circulation system and its function, the anatomy of the heart and its function, blood pressure and hypertension, and we'll also look in this, this part to do with heart attack and myocardial infraction, and we'll also look at angina as well. And lastly, we'll look at the benefits, the effects of exercise on the cardiovascular system, the benefits to it, short term and long term. So to begin with, we'll look at circulatory system, a very basic overview. First thing we should always look at is the heart muscle itself. So it's also known as myocardium. You'll often hear that. The heart is a muscle. It sits just under the breastbone here. So under the breastbone, just off to the left. And it's responsible obviously for pumping blood around your body. It has four chambers, the top chambers, they're called atriums, and the bottom two chambers, they're called ventricles. The top chambers, the atriums, they are the collecting chambers. So that's where blood comes into the heart and collects in the atriums. The ventricles, they're responsible for pumping blood. They contract and they pump blood out of the heart. The left side of the heart, that's more for the oxygenated blood and the right side of the heart's for the deoxygenated blood. How does blood get round about your body? So it's a, through a series of arteries and they are responsible for pumping the blood out. So they are for, more responsible for pumping blood away from the heart. That's the definition of an artery. The definition of a vein on the other hand is to take blood back to the heart. And finally, we've got capillaries. They're the bridge between the arteries and the veins. So if you think of my fingers here as capillaries, these are fine cells. And the artery here, blood, this oxygenated blood, so it's quite big, goes right the way down into these single cells. Uh, the oxygen, the nutrients, the hormones, they all they get to the target tissue. And then they go into these veins, they get back into capillaries again, and they let go of the unoxygenated blood. We've got the waste products, the CO2, for example. They go into these capillaries, and then they go into veins that take blood back to the heart. And that's the circulation system. There's two parts to circulation system. We have pulmonary circulation and we also have systemic circulation. Now we're going to look at pulmonary circulation in this slide. Blood goes into the pulmonary artery from the heart and this is actually deoxygenated blood. So it's commonly thought that all, you may have heard this before, that all arteries contain oxygenated blood and veins contain deoxygenated blood. And in the most part that's true, but when we talk about the pulmonary artery, that is deoxygenated blood getting taken to the lungs for reoxygenation. So blood is getting pumped away from the heart here. So the deoxygenated blood um, is getting is getting through an artery because an artery's definition of it is to take blood away from the heart. With the pulmonary vein, that's taking the oxygenated blood back to the heart. So it's coming through the lungs, back to the heart, then it gets put out through the aorta to the rest of the body. And that's pulmonary circulation. Systemic circulation, that is from the heart to the rest of your body, everywhere, from your brain to your legs, all tissue, the heart itself. And that is through a network of arteries and veins. The difference between arteries, veins and capillaries. Well, blood goes into the artery. It goes down into arterioles. Then it goes to capillaries. So that's the fine cells again. 
into venules and then into the vein. Now the vein, it works a bit different to the artery where it's not under as much pressure. It's under moderate to low pressure where arteries are under high pressure or higher pressure. It works with a series of chambers and valves. And what you see here is the valve. So blood, we've got the vein here and we've got a valve. What happens is blood comes up through a contraction, comes up and moves into the chamber and the valve snaps shut. That prevents the blood from back flowing. Then we move into the next chamber and the valve opens to allow the blood through. But if the blood, when the blood goes to go back, it snaps shut. And this is how the veins work. Endothelium cells, lining, that's on the arteries and the veins, and it's also in your heart muscle as well. We have smooth and elastic fibres. So you think what this is for, this is for the contraction now. And that means that because the veins are going to expand, but so is the arteries. You do see here, if I can highlight this, this part where my highlighter is, this part and this part, you notice the difference in structure and size. The arteries have to deal with a lot more force, so they're bigger and they have a lot more elastic fibre, where the veins, they don't have to deal with as much force. And then we have connective tissue. So the connective tissue is what circulates round about. Blood return, venous return and blood pooling. So as I said before, blood comes into the vein and it comes up. And as you can see where my pointer is, that's the valve as we had before. So blood comes up and it snaps shut to stop blood coming backwards. What can happen, we can get a deep vein thrombosis and it's a condition in which the blood clots in the vein located deep inside the body. So it's usually in the vein in the thigh or the lower legs and it causes a lot of pain and swelling in that affected area. And as you can see, if I can get my highlighter back there, we've got a blood clot and that's where we have the blood thickens on, it actually starts to clot in the side walls. So there's a restriction of the flow of blood, as we call a deep vein thrombosis, very dangerous. Blood itself, well, it's made up of white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, and plasma. The red blood cells, that's where you see the red part, that's where the red pigment, and it's when a red cell is saturated with oxygen, it becomes brighter. The red cells, they contain a substance called hemoglobin, a protein, and that's what carries the oxygenated blood round about the body. And 45% of blood makeup is this red blood cells. 1% of platelets, and what are platelets? Well, they're responsible more for the clotting and healing the wounds. So if I could use the analogy with the capillaries here, when you have a cut and a graze and it oozes out, that's the capillaries. What, does the, what happens when you get a grazed knee over a period of time? It starts to become a lot more gloopy, and then it thickens and it's a scab. That is the capillaries healing, the, that's the platelet, sorry, healing the area. What also is there? Well, 1% of that might be, will be the white blood cells and that will fight the infection that's there. And it also is part of, main part is the human, the body's own immune system and it fights the disease that comes into the body. And the other 54%, which is a big part, is plasma. And that's the transport system of the body. So that's what actually encapsulates this blood and takes it round about the body. The heart itself, well, look a wee bit at the heart and uh, discussion of each single part. We'll start with the valves, the atrium, sorry. We've got the right atrium and the left atrium. So if you remember what I said before, they're the receiving chambers 
and the left side of the heart's more collecting the oxygenated blood that's coming from the lungs and the right side is the deoxygenated blood and that's going back to the lungs we've got the right ventricle and the left ventricle and they're the where the blood gets ejected out the heart because there's a strong contraction there interventricular septum now septum really means separation and it's what separates the ventricles you would also hear it separates your nose that's septum in here so it separates the nostrils have a notice as well the muscle on the side where the left ventricle is that's a lot bigger than the one that's on the right now for the right why is that because that is where the stronger contraction is to get the blood pumped out of the heart round your body where the right side it's pumping blood out but that's pumping blood into the going to the lungs with the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava now inferior and superior above superior below the midline this is where the deoxygenated blood comes in to the so it comes in deoxygenated blood through the inferior and superior vena cava into the right atrium this deoxygenated blood from the body we have the left pulmonary artery and that's where the blood is going to the lungs themselves to be re-oxygenated we have the pulmonary trunk then we've got the left and you've got the right pulmonary veins now they are where the oxygenated blood is coming into the heart so this is where it gets quite confusing and i'd really encourage that you actually draw this out and try and get a wee map going on a piece of paper with this one to get an understanding of it so that's where the blood comes into the left atrium we've got the tricuspid valve and you've got this pulmonary semilunar valve so the tricuspid valve if i can put a wee highlighter here if we can highlight this bit the tricuspid valve as the blood as the ventricles contract and they send blood into the as the atrium sorry contract and they send blood into the ventricles those valves will be open but the semilunar valve here and the aortic valve we'll come to that in a wee second they'll be snapped shut because we don't want blood getting ejected into outside the body at this stage. The bicuspid valve. So this bicuspid valve it is, does a similar job to the tricuspid valve, but on the left side, and blood comes in to the ventricle, and to stop it from coming back as the ventricles contract, that would snap shut. And we'll look at that in just a second or two. And finally we've got the aortic valve where this is what takes the blood round the body along into the aortic arch this heart circulation process so blood is pumped through the heart as follows we've got the superior and inferior vena cavus and that's where the blood's coming in the deoxygenated blood arrives from the body into the right atrium from the right atrium it moves into the right ventricle and from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery it's going to take it to the lungs from the pulmonary artery to the lungs for oxygenation and then from the oxygenated blood moves into the pulmonary vein from the pulmonary vein then to the left atrium the left atrium to the left ventricle to the aorta and then finally moves from the aorta into the full body and again it's good to actually have this draw this out and actually map out on a piece of paper how the blood flows through the heart we've 
we're going to look at the cardiac cycle here. And the first part we should be looking at is diastole, set process part of the cycle. And this is where the heart is more relaxed. We have the bicuspid valve and you have the tricuspid valve. So the tricuspid valve on the right side it is open and the bicuspid valve is open on the left. And that's allowing blood to fill into the ventricles. The aortic valve and the pulmonary valve, they are shut. And I mentioned that earlier, they're going to be shut so that nothing gets out because we need as much blood. The heart wants to get the blood into the left atrium before it contracts and doesn't want anything going outwards at this stage. If we can take a wee closer look at the heart valve during diastole. So the ventricles here, the left and the right, which what you can see. The bicuspid valve, you can see that's open and the tricuspid valve is open. The pulmonary valve, it's going to be closed and the aortic valve is closed. Systole. This part of the cardiac cycle, this is the strongest part a strong part because that's where we get contraction of the ventricles. So the bottom part here actually contracts. So the pulmonary valve and the aortic valves, they're open because that's what's stopping blood going for the pulmonary valve going into the pulmonary artery and sending this deoxygen to blood to the lungs. And the aortic valve it is open because it wants the blood to get out of the heart so as it goes right round the circulation system, the full body. As you can see, the bicuspid valves are shut and the tricuspid valves are shut. And that's to stop blood getting back up into the atriums. So we're going one direction. The heart valve during systole cycle. So we've got the right ventricle again and the left ventricle. And we've got the pulmonary valve, they are open and the aortic valve is open. And the bicuspid valve is closed and the tricuspid valve is closed. So we're going to look here at the electrical impulses and the sinoatrial node. And it's fundamentally the heart's own pacemaker. And it generates electrical impulses and conducts them through the heart muscle. And that stimulates the heart contraction to pump. So the cells, they all communicate with each other and they're controlled by this SA node, the sinoatrial node. So that's the command and control here. That's the general, that's the thing that's in charge. The impulses, electrical impulses come to the heart. They come into the sinoatrial nodes and then it sends a message to all the other cells in the heart because these are all electrically excitable cells to fire in a coordinated fashion. As you can see, it's going round about the, if we can highlight, it's going right round the cells here, right round each chamber to contract at the right moment. Now this part here, that's called the AV node. The AV node is the atrial ventricular node and it makes it more like a pause. It stops the contraction from going down into the lower section of the ventricles until the atriums have contracted fully. Then once the ventricles have contracted, that electrical stimulus goes down this network called the bundle of his. And it branches off into the right and the left bundles. Then it moves down and I haven't got this highlighted, but if I can just put a wee, it was a, I'll put the pen here, you can see it. This part, that's called the Perjingate network. So the contract, this, the impulses go right round here and that contracts the ventricles to get this pumping action. The heart rate itself, well, the myocardium, the heart muscle, it contracts 72 beats on average per minute. Obviously it goes a wee bit above it and a bit below it. 
Um, and it all depends on what we're actually doing. Obviously, during physical activity, you're going to have and working the cardiovascular system is going to increase naturally. And if somebody is sitting on the couch, it's going to be quite decreased. That's what you'd expect. The node is controlled by the SA node and it is part of the autonomic nervous system. Now, where do we get a pulse? As you can see in the picture there, you can get it in the wrist. If I can bring this into view. So I'll take my watch off. It's good to have any restriction there. And if I can bring that in and we put a pulse, we take our fingers and we go in this section here, just down a bit from the thumb and you're in that section there. It's best not to use your thumb because your thumb has got a pulse and you take it for about what, we'll say 30 seconds and times it by two, or you could do 10 seconds and times it by six and that would give you as many beats you've got in a minute. The other place, and this is a much better place to actually go, is the carotid pulse. So that's the brachial pulse, and we go for the carotid pulse in at the neck. Now you can get it on either side. Again, don't use your thumb, and you press just gently in here, in between the sternocleidomastoid and your actual throat, your trachea, and you should feel the beats. Now, if you don't feel that, person does have a pulse, it's just you can't find it, so get used to actually feeling for a pulse. But there's other things that, as you know, it can take a pulse. You don't need to necessarily do it with this. You could do it with your hands. You could do this on a treadmill. It's not as going to be just as accurate, but when they put the hand grips on, just because they're sweating, um, it's warm and so on. And some people don't hold it all the time. You've also got pulse oximeters, which you can buy these out of pharmacists and they just go over the finger and it can tell you the pulse. But you can also, get it on phones nowadays it might not be 100% accurate but the more things you take the more accurate things become blood pressure so blood pressure refers to the amount of force and pressure put on the artery walls as blood flows through them this is a very important thing when it comes to understand when it comes to health and fitness because people do have a lot of blood pressure issues. And it's important to understand our roles and our limits to what we can help our client. There's two parts to this blood pressure. You've got systolic blood pressure. So if you remember systole, part of this cardiac cycle, and that's the strongest part. So that's always going to be a higher number. And we've went for 120. That's what I put in there, and that would be the optimal. That can vary. And then you'll have the lower number, which is the diastolic blood pressure. So that's the lower number. And in the picture there, you can see the 146 over 134. So the top number is the systolic pressure and the lower number is going to be the diastolic pressure. And I've got here 120 to 80. And it's always measured in milliliters, millimeters of mercury. That's what we read blood pressure in. It can be done with a stethoscope, sphygmometer, we call it. And very commonly what we will use is the digital type. And you can have a look at the electrical ones that are really, really good. There's a lot of things that can affect blood pressure though. And you almost take blood pressure before going into the gym, rather if you're doing a health assessment of somebody rather than at the end, because the blood pressure is going to be up it's also important to make sure that people do rest for about five minutes before you do it. And you take, they're not been taking anything like caffeine, uh, caffeine drinks and different things because that really, things in that manner affect blood pressure. You might get a misreading. A person might want to sit down, like I say, for about five minutes before you actually take the thing. And you would do it for about, three, you would take three goes at blood pressure normally. And you would take the one in the middle. And try and always take it for the same place. So if you're using a electronic device, if you've used it one week with someone and you've done one round about a cuff round about the wrist, that the next one, next week you've done it round about the upper arm, they are going to be different. So always try and make sure that you do it in the same place. The blood pressure chart that we've got here, and this is in your online manuals as well. Systolic pressure for low blood pressure is anything below 100. 
and below 60 for the diastolic. So that's quite low. Anything below that is classed as low blood pressure. Now, what was the recommendations there? Well, you, before you start any exercise, you've got to seek medical medical was it, um, medical advice before it's done. That's very, very important. Do not go out with, out with this at all. Optimal, which not everybody sits at. Uh, the older you get, the more it's going to increase the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure within a certain range. So it's 120 over 80. That would be optimal blood pressure. Now you would fill out a par Q there, and that's what you'd want to see within a range there. Stage one hypertension, anything above 140. So if you go up to about 139, that's on the high end of blood, high blood pressure. And hypertension just means high blood pressure. And if we go have anything over 90, then you must refer this person to get checked. And that is very fundamental to do that. It's not to say the person can't come back and you can exercise with them at a, if a doctor deems it appropriate, but they have got to seek medical attention. And if they do come back, they would go and deal with a exercise referral instructor as well. And that's something to maybe look at once you've done the, you can do it when you do the level two, then you can move on to the, do the exercise referral. Since so that potential, this is when things get more a problem and it's 160 systolic pressure and above to a hundreds and above pretty high and that again must person must see medical attention now stage three hypertension this is contraindication to exercise completely so it's 180 for the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure there is a hundred plus and above and you cannot do exercise at all with this person they should always deal with a specialist under supervision to always get referred there we're now going to look at angina pectoris and myocardial infarction which is a heart attack so what you see here is the normal heart rate the heart and it's working perfectly well and the coronary arteries they're the arteries within the actual heart muscle itself so it's the heart's own circulation system as you can see down the bottom here everything is flowing well and blood's getting through angina angina pectoris what we see in the picture well the actual we have plaque building up atherosclerosis and this plaque causes a narrow and it also hardens up the arteries but it narrows the blood flow so blood coming through has to get through this narrowed area and it restricts the amount of blood getting to the heart. So the trouble with angina is that people that live with angina, and you might know people that live with angina, and they can live with it most of their life, that person might do some extra activity, do a bit more than what they normally do. They might even be having an infection of some sort, and that's affected the heart rate. And the blood then has to get through, the heart has to beat faster, and it's to get this blood through this narrowed area. And that's where you hear somebody taking an angina attack. They've got chest pain, but the pain can ease. Not always, but the pain can ease. And that's because as they sit down, the blood pressure returns a bit more to normal and blood again can get through. And this opposite end of the heart muscle, it's restricted the blood flow. So it doesn't get as much blood. And that's where you get the sign symptoms in angina. A myocardial infraction, also known as a heart attack, that's where we have damaged the heart and we have death of the heart through this blood clot and this can happen for a few reasons but you've got a build right up here a plaque and the blood flow is stopped so it's a sudden obstruction of blood flow to part of the heart muscle and part of the heart the part over here dies so if you think of this like you've got a motorway and the cars are the blood and car try a normal day in a normal time Everything's working as normal, and if we're over here, this is the buds of traffic, it's going well. But what happens when you get a lane closure? Well, one lane's actually blocked, then it actually slows things down a bit. 
especially if there's we're at Russia and if this is the heart we're talking about, the Russia is going to be when you are on a treadmill, we'll say, or you're running for the bus and the heart needs more blood. It's to get through that narrowing there. So there's a restriction. But as we get traffic management in place on the motorway, then we get a slowing down and the blood can get through the traffic and through. If we take the motorway analogy here, we've got a uh, lorry has jackknifed the roads and what's happened is nothing gets through. So there's a backup right the way back and the other part of the motorway just stops, but nothing gets there. Now, if that's in the heart, that part is dead and it dies. Hypertension and the effects on the actual brain itself. So you've got a stroke and here it's classified as a brain stroke. And this can be caused by death of the brain. You do get a hemorrhagic stroke and that's where we get a bleed to the brain. And we get a blood clot, and if I can put that there, ischemic stroke. Now, what can happen here is there can be blood getting through, so but it's a restriction of blood. And then we get this plaque buildup, atherosclerosis. And that is where you get a stoppage of blood and part of the brain of the opposite side dies. The common one is a blood clot and part of the brain is dying off. That's the most common one that you're going to see. Now, to identify the signs and symptoms of stroke, it's good to use that pneumonic, and I'm sure you've heard this before, the fast pneumonic. So the very first one here is the face. Has the face fallen on one side? So you may have a client there and their face actually starts to droop. There's many thing, reasons why that can happen, not only in a stroke, that is a sign of it that they can be drooling, they can be a bit of slivering. The fake face is weak. You could ask the person to smile as the person talks. You can see it fall down on one side. And that, if you get that sign, you're possibly dealing with a stroke. You'll treat it as a stroke. Can they raise both their arms up? Maybe one arm can't raise up. Or they have trouble raising their arms. They possibly are going to be more drooping on one side. They've got a loss of power on one side. Speech, that can be slurred, but can also be drunk-like. And that's the trouble here. This is not a joke when I say this, but if we're in a pub and somebody has a stroke, they can just fit in quite well at the, if there's a lot of people drunk, unfortunately. And it's the same with the diabetic. And that's what can make this very difficult sometimes to diagnose. So the speech can be slurred, the problem communicating. They might be talking back to front, they might be talking rubbish, they might be swearing. They might understand fully what they've got to say, but they can't actually physically say it. And if you get any of these signs, you make sure you've it's time to dial 999. Because the quicker you can act, the better chance the person can have a recovery from a stroke. A lot of medication and things they do in hospital, which is beyond me, is time dependent. So we need to get an ambulance to save their life. We're going to look at some terms here, which is very important. And this will help us when we do level three, when you go on and move on to exercise referral as well. Cardiac output. So what is cardiac output? This is the volume of blood pumped out by the heart in one minute. So in one minute, this would be the volume of blood that gets pumped out. With stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood and the left ventricle pushes out in one beat. So this is only one actual beat and it's coming from the left ventricle. It's recorded here. And it's the amount of blood that leaves in one beat, one contraction. Your cardiac output is over a minute. Something that's pretty important and especially when we talk about high blood pressure here is the resistance that the blood vessels offer to blood flow. So the greater the resistance, the higher output pressure. So as you can see here, pressure, it's the pressure against the actual arteries, blood flow, as blood passes through them. And we can possibly have, and you'll do this at a later stage, you'll look at this certainly in level three as well. And we'll say we've got hardening of the arteries. 
we get plaque building up and so on and they become less resistant so the total peripheral resistance increases and the pressure increases it's getting through this narrowing area so coming to the end here of this um, webinar we're going to look at the benefits to exercise that's a very brief side to it so first of all we'll look at the short-term benefits we have faster person's going to have faster heart contractions and it leads to an increased heart rate which increases the circulation that gets this oxygenated blood round about the body and that's going to improve in the short term it does in the long term as well but it improves and more forceful heart contractions are going to happen within each heartbeat which helps leads to a greater amount of blood being pumped through the body but the long-term benefits of this well the heart and lungs become more efficient as your cardio training increases so it's not only important to look at muscle tone it's which is very important and microsoma because that is important it's important to actually develop the heart itself because it makes everything more efficient it makes the person more efficient it decreases the rest in heart rate which means your heart doesn't have to work as hard to get this oxygenated blood round about your body improves the amount of believe it or not the ability to draw in deeper and longer breaths and take fewer breaths it reduces heart disease and the risk of it which is important it reduces levels of LDL low density lipoproteins so that's what you classify as the bad cholesterol and this will be talked about throughout the qualification and it was um because when you have higher levels of LDL there's more likely to for the person to suffer from for example have health problems such as heart attacks strokes uh, heart failure and so on and in turn it encourages higher levels of evidence shows that shows that the person can develop higher levels of HDL which is the good but is the good say good bacteria that's not it the good fat the good cholesterol so high density lipoproteins and that's the benefits so that's us come to the end of the webinar and I'm glad you bear with us with this one you're going to see a lot of these videos as well in the online manual so they're all going to be broken up and put into the online manual in the circulatory system so you can go back over it but it's good to go back over the video as well and look at it and break it down bit by bit it's good to draw out and stop this video at any point as well so you can watch it more than once obviously hopefully it was of help and if you get any questions make sure you contact body core put it in the facebook group talk to your pt mentor and we can go back over it at some point take care folks it was a pleasure doing this